My name is Denise Hendricks. My story is going to be about when I was set up to die and survived. When I was 20 years old, I was going to uh, Columbia College in Chicago and I'd saved up enough money to buy my first car. I was very excited. So I called up my um, stepbrother's cousin. Hey, I got a car, do you wanna see it? He was like, yeah, I'm over here. It was a house they were hanging out in Evanston. Illinois. So I drove over there. He comes outside and he checks out the car and he's like, congratulations, good stuff. I'm proud of you. And he's like, we're all inside. Hang out. Come meet my friend. So I go inside and there was one guy there. He was uh, my step cousin's friend. Very handsome, seemed really polite and we hung out for a little while and then it got time for me to leave. And as soon as I got up to leave, he got up and he was like, I know you just met me, but it's okay if you give me a ride. And he's like chatting me up and gets my number. Then we start hanging out after that. Then we came a little bit more than friends. Other people that we knew from the from the town was like, oh yeah, you know, he has a girlfriend. I'm like, that's not what he told me. I get a call on my phone and I don't know how this person got my number and it's some girl. He's like, yeah, you're dealing with my man. And I'm just like, girl, what are you talking about? And uh, she says his name. I'm like, yeah, well, he lied to you and he lied to me. Why are you so angry with me? You should take it up with him. And she's like, yeah, well, I don't care if he lied to you or not. Just because you touched him, now I want to beat your ass. I just kind of laughed it off. I'm like, listen, say less. I don't need the drama. So like a day or two later, I meet up with him and I'm like, yo, somebody called my phone. I don't need this drama. It's stupid and it's, it's beneath me and I don't want to deal with it. And he kept saying, oh, she's not going to do anything. She's not going to do anything. And I'm like, that's not the point. The point is that you lied and you led me to believe something else, which is not true. And he kept insisting, like, how is she my girlfriend when I've known her? I, I met her around the same time I met you. And I'm like, well, that's what she thinks and that it has nothing to do with me. And he was, uh, he didn't like, he did not like that. And over the next two days, he like, just calling me, calling me repeatedly, just blowing my phone up. I had been dealing with him for about a month and a half now at this point. He's calling, he's texting, he's apologizing. He's like, you know, we started out as friends, let's just hang out, blah, blah, blah. I didn't respond to anything. Two days later, I'm getting ready to go out. I'm going to meet my sister and her boyfriend. I'm going to go pick him up. He calls me. And I answer and he, you know, he's like, can we hang out? I'll just get in the car. We can talk and I can explain myself, things like that, something like that. So I tell my sister, yo, I'm going to go meet with him real quick. And this was like back in the day when I indulged in marijuana. So we were going to smoke and talk in the car. So I told her I'd meet you. I'll pick you guys up afterwards. So I go to meet him. I pulled up on this street called uh, Lake Street in Evanston and I parked by this like kind of well-known park in the area called Penny Park and he comes out and he comes and opens my car door and he leans in and he tries to kiss me and I kind of I pull back and I'm like what are you doing kind of laughed it off he's like I'm like are you gonna get in because I you know I gotta go somewhere after this and he's like no I'll come upstairs you know my this is my friend's house we've got some there we're gonna hang out and I'm just like all right but I can't stay long you know I thought you were gonna get in the car and he's like no it's cool before I like continue you have to understand I've been like to other friends houses with him I didn't think anything of it up until this point you know he was nothing but nice charming well-mannered open the doors for me like things like that like seemed like a great person um he did say that when he was younger he was in a gang and that he grew up and he's older now and he's wiser. I just turned 20, he was 27. It was like a three flat apartment. It was on the third floor and we was on the outside steps and um, and it was like, like a straight shot up. So it was like kind of weird and dangerous. So he grabs my hand. He kind of like leads me upstairs. He opens the door and his, there's a guy in there and the guy, he introduces me to his friend and he's kind of like sweeping stuff up off the floor. You know, I say hello to him, shake his hand, you know, dab him up, whatever. And I sit down. I had my purse with me and the guy I was talking to before, the one that invited me over, says, oh, go grab a glass because there's a bottle out on the table. I immediately thought that was weird. I was like, I don't live here. Why would I go in his kitchen? And his friend's like, oh, no, it's okay. I'm just, I got to I gotta clean this up. And he's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. Just go ahead, put my purse down. I started walking towards the kitchen. And as soon as I get past a door in the hallway, it opens and out walks a bunch of females I've never met before. And then another girl that I, I knew from high school. It's kind of like like slow motion. Like I kind of just froze like like a deer in headlights because I was just like my stomach like dropped out of my like on the ground. Like I was like, what is happening? So now I'm surrounded and I could I could see like maybe six females. 
and the two guys and they're yelling and they're screaming. I'm just not saying anything. I'm just standing there because I'm like frozen. One girl walks up and she just pull, pulls her arm back and punches me right in the face. And I just, I was never like a real soft person. I just kind of absorbed it and kind of just like looked back at her and she like got mad that it didn't hurt me. Then they all like basically attacked me, like pounced on top of me. I'm like backed into the, in the kitchen and my back is against the stove and they're punching, kicking, stomping on me, like just like attacking me. I just kind of like ball up like this and I'm like, like blocking and just like, at this point I haven't even said anything because I'm, like I said, I was like completely like shot and shocked and caught off guard. Things are a little bit out of sequence, but at one point the guy that I was talking to come in and he kind of like stands next to a girl who I later found out that's the girl that called me on the phone threatening me and they had a weapon in their hand. I found out later it was like a wooden pole. To me it looked like a rusty pipe or something like that and they start beating me with the rust with the pole. At a certain point the guy that I met whose house is supposed to be that was sweeping up when I walked in he comes in the kitchen he's like yo 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 stop 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 nobody touch her nobody touch her you know everybody stops and he walks up and he like he grabs my arms and he's like trying to pull my arms down off my face he's like it's okay it's okay it's fine nobody's gonna hit you anymore you can go you can go nobody's gonna hit you anymore so he pulls my arm down off my face and at this point i'm thinking okay fine at least somebody in here has some sort of sense and he full force punches me dead in my face and knocks me out completely unconscious he just did that so they could stop by my face better because I was blocking and they weren't getting in the hits they wanted to or whatever. I'm unconscious and like I, when I wake up, I'm like being like brutally beaten. I felt like they were trying to crush my skull. Like that's how the force of all these feet and like weapons and I don't know what else they were hitting me with. I can't even be honest, but I, something said in my head like, oh my God, they're trying to kill you because eventually something's gonna break, you know? You can't keep stomping on somebody's skull like that and, and face like that. I decided that, um, okay, well, I have to fight back. I kind of like, mind you, all these people are on top of me. I just kind of like pushed up and kind of like stood up and I reached back by the stove burner and I just felt for what I could and I grabbed the, uh, the stove burner, the thing that goes on top where the, you put the pot on top and I just swing, boom, and I hit one of the girls, she goes down, and I swing again, and everybody like, it kind of like, they kind of like parted like the Red Sea, and I just ran, I made it to the front door. The door that I just came through, like, probably maybe, I don't know how long I was unconscious for, but like, the door I just came through, it had three locks on it. I get to the door, I open the first lock, click, second lock, click, then third lock, the one that was on the doorknob, and then I turn the doorknob and I open the door and I am literally lifted off my feet by my hair and slammed on the ground boom by the same guy that just punched me in the face and like then he grabs the door and slams it back shut so I was like this close to getting out just for reference this is a grown and I was 20 years old and I was 125 pounds I'm only five foot two he literally lifted me off my feet then I tried to like get up again the girl that I hit she comes around the corner with the same stove burner and whacks me in the face with it boom and I fall back and every time like I fall back somebody like grabs me and holds me up then I I like push them push them off like I'm like semi-conscious and I run towards the window because at this point like I'm gonna just jump out the window I knew I'd probably break an arm or a leg but I'd survive they grabbed me before I could make in the window they're like and this is like countless yelling and screaming like I don't even know what they were saying at this point and I wasn't trying to hear anything I was just trying to get out they grabbed me um and stopped me from jumping out the window. Someone told him to be holding me up. The girl picked up the bottle that was on the table when I came in and she like bashes me over the head with the bottle. All I remember is like woozy. I just felt my face get like really hot and I just touched my face and then I looked at my and then looked at my hand and my hand was completely covered in blood. Like it was just it was just like spouting out of my head at this point. And then I look over and there's a girl on the wall and she's looking like straight ahead. She's not looking directly at me. This is the only person in there that I knew from school. I kind of reached out the same hand towards her and I said her name. And as soon as I said her name, boom, I just passed out. At this point, like fighting to wake up, fighting to stay awake. I just kept saying like, get up, get up in my mind, like open your eyes, open your eyes. And my eyes are like, there's blood all over me, in my face. At this point, the shirt that I had worn over there was completely torn off. My bra was torn off. I was like naked from the waist up. Well, I guess this is how it ends, you know? It's like, what else am I gonna do? I'm being hit by like five females and bottles and stove burners and grown men. At one point, the person, the guy that punched me in the face had his foot on my head. Construction, steel toe work boots. I was unconscious and then I like woke up like because I felt this burning sensation on my back and I popped up. One of the guys had put his cigarette out on my back. The girls were 
back in the kitchen, running around talking, trying to figure out what to do. At one point, they, these are the men, grabbed my pants and started pulling my pants down. One of the females was like, what are you doing? He was like, oh, well, you know, and she's like, nah, 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 not here, not here. I guess that was his girlfriend or something like that. And apparently assault and attempted murder is okay, but rape is not. Obviously, I can't fight seven people. So I decided to just start praying. I wasn't very religious. I only knew like one prayer and that was the Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. So I start saying that. And before I could finish it, every time I'd pass out, and then I'd come to again and I just kind of tried to like pick up where I left off but I know I finished it and at one point I'm laying there I'm trying to say the prayer and these people had to been like possessed or something because here I am here's a bloodied half naked girl who's spouting bleeding everywhere mumbling on the ground she was so disturbed by it. she bent down she said what the what the you say that's one of the uh, parts that sticks out to me the most because why do you care what I'm saying I'm your prisoner at this point and she was just like screaming and yelling and pacing back and forth and at one point I felt something cold rubbing up and down my back and I'm in and out of consciousness at this point and I'm still trying to finish the prayer and all I hear is I don't know about the rest of y'all but I'm not going to jail for this and for the kill this bitch. so then she like starts pressing the knife into my back and one of the girls grabbed the knife out of her hand and she was just like, calm down or like, wait, just wait. And then they start discussing how to kill me and what to do with my body. One of the girls was like, oh yeah, let's strip her naked and we can dump her in the ditch. I'm hearing them talk about what to do with my dead body. So I just continued praying. What am I going to do at this point? I'm probably going to die. You know, they would already said, might as well kill her because we're going to go to jail. So I remember getting to the end of the prayer and there was a knock on the door. It's all this like whispering and rushing around and they go outside. And whoever came in the door was like freaking out because here's a half naked bloody girl on the ground. All I hear is boil some water, go out the back door. A lot of whispering and running around. I heard doors open, doors closed. I like tried to get up and and one of the girls was like, don't move, don't move. The people that came through the door were just sitting there talking for a second. They were like, don't move, the ambulance is coming, the ambulance is coming, something of that sort. And I kept trying to get up and they kept pushing me, the girl kept pushing me back down, like, don't move, the ambulance is coming. Then I hear sirens, some more doors open and some more people leave and the police come in and literally the police officer is like, oh my and he like flips me, like like helps, makes me sit up and he's like, oh my God, are you okay? What happened to you? What happened to you? I'm like, I can't talk, I can't talk because the girl that just attacked me was standing right there. The people that came in and told her to call the ambulance were gone at that point. They put me in the ambulance and they take me to the hospital. It was almost like I didn't feel anything that happened in that house. But as soon as like I got in the ambulance and they put me on some stiff board, like I felt like my head was just going to fall apart. It was the most excruciating pain I'd, I'd ever felt. At this point, my mom was working at the hospital that they were taking me to. We get there, they do x-rays, a CAT scan. They like gave me like a IV pain medication. I like was screaming, I was shaking. I was just really in bad shape my mom came and she's like oh my god you know she's like she was trying to stay calm um because she knew if she started crying that i would flip out they were like some of the people the nurse had taken care of me knew my mom and so they were just like i can't believe this is your daughter you know i didn't want her to be like embarrassed i don't know if, i don't know that's why I, that's the way i was thinking of it like how embarrassing for her then they were like saying oh you can take her home now you know I, I mean i don't have any clothes because my pants were torn and they like the endless cut them off me anyway my shirt was already ripped off so i would have to leave in the hospital dog her and the nurse like helped me go to the bathroom i get into the bathroom and i look at myself in the mirror and i just started screaming like i just started screaming because like i did not recognize myself i was so swollen three times the size it was. I looked like that horrible picture they showed of Emmett Till in the casket. That's that's like the type of swelling we're talking about. I was staying with my aunt because I was in college at the time. So she takes me to my aunt's house and they help me upstairs. I'm like heavily medicated. So I like pass out or whatever. The hospital calls the next morning and they said I had multiple hematomas. I had a fractured skull where I was hitting the head with the bottle. They had put two or three staples in there. They had like shaved that area where they stapled my head back together. And the facial x-ray, they said that I was hit so hard in the face that my nose was broken, but it wasn't wasn't even a fracture an entire piece of bone from here to here in my orbital socket was just shattered like it was it was off it was free floating it wasn't attached to my 
nose anymore. Cigarette burn on my back and like little cuts all over my back. I guess uh, the girl had started like cutting or scratching my back with a knife or whatever. My hair was so matted with blood. I, I used to wear my hair short, but I'd let it grow it out that year. And it was like down here and it's curly. And it was just like, it was so matted with blood. And my head was so swollen that my aunt just took the clippers and just shaved all my hair off. I had the staples in my head and they had to keep that clean. And they had to monitor the hematomas to make sure they didn't get bigger. They were like blood clots or whatever. The police had gotten my purse. When I was in there, they rifled through my purse. And at one point before they had started talking about killing me, they were like holding my IDs like and reading off the dress and like, this is where you live. Okay, we know where you live. So they like, they had all my credit cards, whatever cash I had in there, it was gone. And um, they had my car keys. Mind you, my car was still parked on the street in front of the park where I pulled up. My aunt had the spare key. So she goes and gets my car. They canceled my credit cards. I was incapacitated. My phone was still there. So my phone rings and my aunt, you know, she grabs and she answers it. She's like, who is this? You know, like interrogating them. The person on the other line, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't help you. So she puts it on speakerphone. I'm like, who is this? My lips were also like busted and swollen and my speech was like not the best so I'm like who is this and um when I got hit in the head and I saw that girl standing against the wall that I knew from school that was her she was apologizing and saying that she's so sorry for not helping me and that she was so afraid that if she tried to help me they would turn on her my aunt's like well now you need to do the right thing because at this point I had no idea who these people were I didn't know their names I didn't know where they were from the only person I knew was the guy who set me up she and her mother go down to the police station she tells them everything if it wasn't for her I wouldn't even know their name after she did this then the police also my aunt took me down to the police station to pick out their pictures out of a lineup it wasn't like it was it's not like any movie it was like a, a book of photos and I was able to identify them I don't think I'll ever forget what they look like and as I identified them they'll be like yeah that's so and so turns out that two of the girls was the guy I was talking to sister the other two was his quote unquote girlfriend and her sister the other guy was his friend throughout the investigation I found out that they were more people in that house than I knew. Apparently, they were having a party before I got there. When I pulled up, everyone went in the room and hid. When I came in, I, I thought it was just him and his friend there. Turned out there was, during the entire assault, there were two or three or four other people hiding in the room, absolutely afraid to come out. They could have came out any time and stopped it. They could have came out and helped me, and they did not. The days following that, they were on the run. I'm trying to heal. Eventually, three weeks or a month later, I had to have facial reconstructive surgery the police would call me so they kept like catching one catching each one one after the other and whenever they caught one the other one would snitch on, one, on another person then they would like come and update me and tell me like that's how I found out there were more people in that house the step cousin who I wouldn't even know this guy if it wasn't for this person because I went to show this person my car. He was in that house before I got there and when I when I pulled up in my car the girl said that he looked out the window and said, oh yeah, there she is, that's her car. Then him and his girlfriend left out the back door. It was more than one person I was set up by. All it would have taken was a text message. Didn't even have to call me. Anyone had to say was Phineas, don't go in the house. Don't believe him. Nobody stopped me. Stopped me. I had black eyes for like three months. Everyone at work sent cards and like gifts and stuff like that. I was a receptionist at a retirement home. <laughs> assured me like, you know, whatever, you're feeling better, your job is secure. Leading up to the first court case, so it was me, my mom, my stepdad, we get there. I didn't want to see them. I didn't, the victim's advocate person that was there, she like, oh, I heard about you, what he did to you. And she took me aside and she, this lady starts telling me how this guy that I've been talking to for a month and a half was a diagnosed sociopath with psychopathic tendencies. And then she opened, then she shows me his rap. I'd never seen so many charges in my life. It was like 30, 40 charges. Like he had a lot of domestic batteries, like does harm to women, things like that. And then he uses this charm to like convince them to drop the charges. And I was just like, are you serious? She's like, yeah, everyone's either too afraid to press charges. They don't show up for court. They just want to forget what happened and they just, or they're too afraid of him or they don't want to be bothered with it. And she said, I'm the only person, the only woman that followed through, the only woman that press charges. How do they just have these people just walking around? And she was just saying, usually it's just him. So there was one incident with the mother of his child where his two sisters beat her up. 
and he was there and he you know he basically set her up too he's like but what he did to you this is the worst charge he's ever gotten like six months after this happened I go to my doctor because I kept having these like this pain in my head this throbbing pain and um my doctor examined me did x-rays he's like there's he said physically there's nothing wrong with you anymore and I'm like so what is this pain in my head and he he said hold out your hand like this so I held out my hand and my hand was just like this and I'm like why 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 is my hand shaking he's like because you have PTSD he never left me alone like he had he wasn't supposed to be contacting me in prison he had people three-way calling me I had to change my phone number I moved he, he's never actually left me alone three of the girls got three years was sentenced to three years in prison his friend got eight years he had a longer rap sheet and the person that set me up got five years one of the girls was a minor so she got like a slap on the wrist he served his five years and then got out and they notify you every time each person gets out and then my car window was busted out my tires were slashed every time I try to report it being I'm like I know who this is that you know he he's a career criminal he would bust out other people's windows in the same vicinity so it looked like a random thing this has happened to me three times at one point when I was living in Skokie I had parked my car on the side of the building because it had already gotten the windows busted out. My car was set on fire. The fire department came, put out the fire. Everybody in the building had to get out. And they said, your window was cracked. Somebody poured accelerant on the inside and set it on fire. It was ruled an arson. It was set on fire. So the fire department said, told me it was an arson. He used to send me Facebook friends requests. I, at one point, I deleted all social media because I was just over it. Like, And I started my photography company and I was in the business class and they said, that's free marketing. So I opened it another Facebook page and it was like public now I have like a filter on my messenger and I get like like messages but I won't see them until like a month or two later and I go and check like the filter whatever and it'd be a message from him I've blocked over 30 or 40 different fake accounts he's made to stalk me and comment on my posts I just go through like bouts of depression from the outside looking in and just seems like she's doing well in life everything's fine why is she depressed what you know what's her problem I'm being stalked I'm being harassed part of all of their sentencing is to never contact me ever again like it was just the judge said if you come within like a certain feet or if you contact her via on the phone in any way shape or form you're in violation of this order court order whatever so it was already in place i just could not prove it was him every time he called me from prison it wasn't him calling me it was his friend because he would collect call them and then they would three-way call me and i cut i cut that off by changing my number what what am i gonna do he went to prison for five years they came out it was maybe six months to a year before my windshield was busted if i want to i could put a restraining order another one against him but it was just like then I'd have to go to court and then I have to see him again. And that's that's what he wants. He wants to see me. Part of the reason why he feels so empowered to do this is because I don't say anything about it. I don't want anything to be in the dark. He stalks his sister too, by the way, because half of the accounts, the fake accounts that he made to stalk me are in her name. He uses her name. He uses her pictures. He uses other sister name. He created a fake account to pretend to be his sister and then he posted a picture of himself or a video of himself like oh this is really a good guy I wrote a book about him making him painting him out to be the bad guy but he's really a good guy and it doesn't matter because the book didn't sell anything anyway and the whole time that this he's acting like he's his sister saying this about himself he, he's out of his mind first I was grateful to our creator God the universe whatever you want to call this person the reason why we're here I was so thankful because I was supposed to die that night and I didn't. One of the most important thing I take away from that is that human beings have two brains, like the one here and the one here. I remember feeling that night, like felt this feeling in my stomach and that was my intuition telling me something was wrong, something was off. But here I have this person smiling in my face, acting nice, like like everything was okay. So I literally ignored my own intuition. I literally ignored my own intuition because I didn't want to think bad of people. That's part of human nature. It's like it, it, we're born with that second brain to keep us out of danger. And anytime you, and that's what I have now, I grow up, I have children now, and, and that's one of the most important things I taught my children is never ignore your intuition. It's there for a reason. It's there to save you. Two, probably the most important thing is that we, people want to act like, and I'm not at all religious, so People would act like we're on this rock floating in space all by ourselves for absolutely no reason. And it's just not true. I can never believe that because for the longest time I was so angry with God. Like, how are all these children getting murdered and raped and unalived? And sorry, I don't even know what words I'm supposed to say, but would you 
you chose to save me. Why? Through therapy and through like my own spiritual awakening, I came to the conclusion like maybe I, I, I made it out of the house just so I could tell this story. Maybe I made it out of the house just so I could let people know that they're not alone. I'll never get all my questions answered about why me and not this, why not somebody else. I come to the conclusion that God and the devil are separate people. No one's sitting up in the sky. No one's sitting down there. They're all within us. God is within us. The devil is within us. And we have to get up every day and make the choice of who we want to be and who do we want to listen to, who we want to follow. So when I prayed that night, it was the God in me that saved me. And those people that were surrounding me, that were trying to kill me, that's the devil in them controlling them. And that's when I realized that we are powerful beings, if only we knew. Our words have powers. Our thoughts have powers. And I'll never forget one of the females bending down whatever demon or, or satanic entity was in her was completely livid that I was laying on the ground praying. And this is from a non-religious person. I've made peace with all of it. I understand now. I get it. I'm not. And most importantly, I'm not afraid of anyone. There isn't a human being on this planet that strikes fear in my heart. I will never be afraid of anyone ever again. Whether you're religious or not, or spiritual or whatever, the universe or God didn't put all these tools on this earth for us not to use them. Therapy is one of those tools given uh, given to us by God, given to us by the universe. Yes, prayer changes, I'm proof of that, but also putting in the work and going to therapy can really change your life. And, and do not let anyone make you feel ashamed of going to therapy, of bettering yourself, of finding your happiness.